This is Doug Crawford Brown uh, giving a presentation on the Cambridge Retrofit Community Scale Mobilization Program. I'm using the example of Cambridge Retrofit, but actually this is part of a, a larger community scale mobilization program that can be brought to any community uh, around the world. And this presentation will give you a sense of how this was developed in Cambridge, uh, Cambridge in the UK, not Cambridge in Massachusetts, and um, invite you to uh, use the same methodology in your own community. So what are we? Cambridge Retrofit is a name, certainly. It's therefore a brand. It is a set of projects bringing energy efficiency improvements to buildings throughout the city of Cambridge, about 65,000 buildings over the next 30 years by 2050. And it is also a, um, a group of people, uh, people involved in various aspects of Retrofit who you'll meet as we go forward. It consists of three coordinated programs, or it's part of three coordinated programs. Uh, these can be divided in two directions. One is whether it's a public sector or private sector activity. Cambridge Retrofit is primarily private sector, although with uh, significant and important pr uh, participation by the public sector. Action on Energy is about retrofits also in Cambridge, and it is a Cambridge City Council activity, so it's public sector, MLEI or Mobilizing Local Energy Initiative is also a public sector activity. It focuses a bit more on bringing low carbon energy into the community rather than on retrofits, but it does do retrofits also. So Cambridge Retrofit, primarily private sector, entirely about energy efficiency, action on energy, primarily public sector, uh, focusing on retrofits, and then MLEI, primarily public sector, with with more energy production, but also with a bit of retrofit. The Cambridge Retrofit program was divided into four stages or four phases from about 2010 to 2012, actually more like 2008 to 2012. A group of students from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill and the University of Cambridge developed a database on the various properties for uh, Cambridge. You'll see this database later in the presentation. The next phase when 2012 to 2013, a little bit into 2014, was social mobilization of seven categories of actors. You'll meet those actors later on in the presentation. So this phase is focused on simply getting those seven categories of actors to begin working together on the area of, of retrofits, low carbon energy, and so forth. Phase two was then to create a series of pilot projects, demonstration projects, to test whether the methodology that was being developed um, in Cambridge Retrofit would be feasible. Would there be technological challenges, legal challenges, financial challenges, social challenges, and so forth, and then to develop strategies to get around problems that might arise. And then finally, phase three, which really gets going or has gotten going in late 2016, moving forward to 2050, is rollout of the tested methodology. First, looking at big stakeholders, the university, the, the city council, and so forth, and then moving into individual property holders. The pilot's first phase, for the second phase, well, it's the third phase, but it's called phase two, uh, were carried out almost entirely, almost, not exactly, almost entirely by the Action on Energy partner. Um, and so this was very much to the credit of the, the local government. You can see the postcodes for the Cambridgeshire area, which is the area that the Cambridge retrofit deals with. And you can also, in the boxes, you can see the numbers of properties that were retrofit in those in those postcodes. So now, off to the, 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 the meat, we might say, of the uh, presentation. The easiest part is conducting the baseline research. I, I say easy because those of us in academia have been doing this for a long time. Um, it was easy for me because all I had to do was to let the students run off and, and do the baseline research. So let's see what the baseline suggests for the city of Cambridge. 
These are the Department of Energy and Climate Change, the former Department of Energy and Climate Change. It's now been rolled into the, the business um, ministry within the, the UK. These show the trajectories of carbon reduction that have been set as the UK target uh, for out to 2050. Notice that between today and 2050, there would be an 80% reduction in carbon dioxide emissions. And there are different trajectories that would reach that, the except, with the exception of the one at the very top, the alpha one at the very top. Um, but um, uh, all of these trajectories get to 2050, and they all are going to be coming down, um, let's say smoothly down to 2050. We cannot go out to 2050 and then immediately drop down in 80%, both because it's impossible to do that in a short period of time, uh, but also because what matters is the total carbon dioxide released between today and 20. 50, and so it's the area under the curve that matters and we would be releasing too much carbon dioxide if we waited until 2050 and then could suddenly drop down to the 80% reduction. So it's a smooth transition down to 2050 on roughly the pathways that you see here. These are the targets. These show 2010, 2020, and, and so forth. Notice the national ambitions are the bars. The, the bar heights show you the percentage of today's carbon dioxide emissions that would remain in each of these decades. Uh, it shows you the national ambitions, and the Cambridge City Council voted to have an even more ambitious reduction target, which was 90% reduction. I've left the dashed line here because that is the national ambition and it's written into the Climate Change Act and therefore whatever it is that the council achieves, whatever Cambridge achieves, it must at least hit this 80% reduction target. We then spent a, a good deal of time, almost always when I say we, I mean the, the students who did a lot of this work, looking at the various technologies of retrofit in buildings. And you can see here the estimate of the average amount of carbon reduction that one gets from different kinds of retrofit activities, all the way from loft insulation to interior and exterior wall insulation, draft proofing, and so forth. Now, if you apply these various technologies, just be aware that they don't add. If you put in loft insulation and you put an interior wall, you would not take the 46% reduction from interior wall and add it to the roughly what looks like about 18% reduction from loft insulation, you'll get slightly uh, smaller than the sum of those two. Uh, but this gives a rough indication of how much you would get in, in reduction if you one were to apply these various technologies. We used the estimates based on heed need. These are national databases and they look at what actually happens in carbon reduction when you do these uh, measures, not what a building energy model suggests. And the reason that we use the databases to do this is that some people use the the energy efficiency improvement in their buildings to drive down the the amount of energy that they consume, they keep the temperature constant and decrease the amount of energy. Other people keep their energy constant and use the energy efficiency to increase their interior temperature in their buildings. If they do the latter, then they're not actually reducing carbon dioxide. And about a third of people will do the latter, about two thirds will do the former. The cost is roughly a billion pounds, um, at least it was in 2011. The pound has been going through all sorts of fluctuations as a result of the, the Brexit vote, so I don't know what the final number will be. It will certainly be north of a billion pounds, probably closer to 1.5 to 2 billion pounds. The interesting feature about this is that that's on the order of the amount of energy uh, spend in the city of Cambridge. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, you may, may, I emphasize, uh, be able to pay back the cost of the retrofits on the basis of the energy saved. However, that depends very critically on what happens to the price of energy, and we just don't know how that's, uh, that's going to change over time. 
If we are successful, then you see a, a more elaborate version of a chart that you saw earlier. Um, this shows the national ambition, which is always the one on the left side of a, of a set of bars. You see the uh, uh, Cambridge ambitions in the dark purple on the right-hand side in each of these bars. And then in the middle, you see what will happen if Cambridge retrofit is uh, achieved and it achieves its worst case, which means that one third of people uh, use the energy efficiency improvements to decrease their, um, uh, excuse me, one third of people use the energy efficiency improvements to increase their interior temperature, and the other two thirds use it to decrease their energy use in their, in their buildings. Notice that the retrofit activity, if it is successful, uh, gets you about a third of the way to the reduction that you're trying to achieve. And this is typical for not only uh, Cambridge, but for all over the UK, and in fact, all over the world that retrofits are an important component of, of climate policy, uh, but they get you only about a third of the way. You then need to bring in low carbon energy, you have to decarbonize your grid and so forth, and you need to bring in low carbon transport. We created, and you can download from a site that I'll mention at the very end of the presentation, a, an Excel uh, model which has two components to it, the energy system that is used, you see that in red, and the efficiency of the buildings. We divide the buildings in Cambridge up into the categories that you see here, which is industry, business, uh, residential, the government, university, and so forth. And what this spreadsheet does is it calculates what the emissions are today in the city of Cambridge and what they will be under different amounts of retrofitting of buildings out into the future. And you produce these bar charts that you see on the lower right hand side showing how much CO2 emission is still occurring in each of the various sectors. Um, mobilizing local energy investment that I talked about earlier is more in the red area that we see on this uh, slide slide and the uh, Cambridge retrofit and action on energy is more in the in the blue area on the slide. If one opens up this spreadsheet, what you find are pages of various kinds. You can download the spreadsheet from the file, from, excuse me, from the website that you'll see at the very end of the presentation. And what you do is you specify for here industry business, you specify for electricity use and natural gas use, what percentage of floor area has been retrofit. In this example, 25% of the floor area of the uh, industry businesses have been retrofit. And then you specify what percentage reduction in the final right-hand column is going to occur in catering, computing, cooling, ventilation, etc. And that then calculates for you in the blue boxes, it calculates the percentage reduction in electricity for the city of Cambridge, the percentage reduction in natural gas for the city of Cambridge, and so on. So it does this for all of the categories that you're interested in. In this example, every category of energy use has been reduced by 50% just as an example. This then goes into, or this information goes into a part of the model which looks at the percentage reduction in electricity and energy in um, the city of Cambridge for the different sectors in 2015, 2020, 2030, 2040, and 2050. So notice that the 12.5% that appeared earlier uh, for net electricity and natural gas has now been entered for the year 2030 in the industry business sectors. And when that happens, the model recalculates for you what the city's carbon dioxide emissions are going to be after you've done the retrofit. So you'll notice from this figure that only the industry business sector has come down in height in its bar, and that's because we only adjusted that by 12.5%. We left all the other sectors alone. CCRM in this slide refers to the Climate Change Risk Mitigation Project. Um, that's the website that I'm going to show you later on through which you can get more information about the Cambridge retrofit and related programs. 
One of the challenges with uh, doing carbon footprinting is what is included in the carbon footprint. This is a, a graph which shows the uh, source of carbon dioxide uh, for things consumed within the UK. Notice that about two-thirds of the carbon emissions or carbon dioxide emissions associated with UK um, activities come from carbon dioxide produced while things are going on inside the UK. Goods and services consumed by residents uh, and generated by UK households. However, a lot of the goods that are um, uh, bought by the people in the UK are imported goods and those that carbon dioxide from those imported goods is not attributed to the person who consumed it, it's attributed to the country that produced the goods. So if we buy a refrigerator from China, for example, that does not show up in the carbon footprint for the city of Cambridge or for the UK. And about a third of the emissions are coming from that. So if one goes to the Cambridge retrofit um, estimates of carbon reduction, um, you probably need to be thinking in terms of another one third of CO2, which is in the imported goods and services. We call it embedded or embodied in imported goods and services. Cambridge retrofit does not account for those because we don't track goods uh, throughout the world. We do, however, include the embedded carbon of the materials that are used in the retrofit. So how much carbon and energy went into producing the insulation, the wall, the windows, the doors, and so forth. And to do that, we use the inventory of carbon and energy estimates, which you can see from the website that I show you here. Now, the next easiest part. So, so that was background information. The next easiest part is creating supply, being able to deliver retrofits. That's done in Cambridge Retrofit and in all community activities by bringing together a set of actors. You need all of these actors present in the activity in order to get uh, economies of scale, in order to aggregate supply, aggregate demand, aggregate finance. The first one, and absolutely the critical one, is the building owners, the building owners and occupants. This shows the University of Cambridge, who were one of the founding members of Cambridge Retrofit. Fit. So you need people who want their buildings retrofit. If there's nobody who wants their buildings retrofit, it doesn't matter what sort of supply chain you create, you are not going to get a retrofit activity going forward. The next is delivery agents. These are people who show up at your building and actually carry out the retrofit. They might be engineering firms, they might be construction firms, they might be uh, real estate firms, etc. The next is finance. Somebody's got to provide the finance for this. This might be finance as a, a, a debt. This might be finance as equity. This might be a grant from government and so forth. Then you need suppliers. These are people who are not showing up at your house to do the retrofit or showing up at your property to do the retrofit. They are supplying the windows, the doors and so forth to the delivery agents. Then we have innovators. If everything were, were working perfectly in the retrofit world, we wouldn't need innovators. But uh, what we do need are some innovators who will bring in new technologies that will drive down the cost of doing a retrofit. They will make the materials that are used in retrofits more reliable. They might, for example, reach the holy grail of very thin wallpaper, thin insulation that is paintable and that will heal itself if uh, a nail is driven through it and so forth. So innovation in the case of Cambridge Retrofit is carried out through Cambridge Clean Tech. 
We need educators. These are not people like myself who are academics. These are people who show up in homes and businesses and so forth and educate them on the process of doing the retrofits and the need for doing retrofits. So this shows uh, Cambridge Carbon Con Conversations, which is a group that will go into homes, blocks of homes and so forth, and walk people through activities that, that help them understand the retrofit needs. And then finally, you need policy and planning people. You need government, you need, in the case of England, you need English heritage, um, both providing incentives for retrofits, perhaps requiring retrofits to be done, but also potentially uh, uh, providing grants and other support mechanisms for uh, retrofits. The mobilization part of Cambridge Retrofit, and, and this is true in every community, um, has to do with assembling, we call it the coalition of the willing, the groups that are willing to carry on retrofits, and also the coalition of the able. It's all well and good that somebody was willing to do something, but if they're not able, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't do the retrofit effort much use. So here is just a sampling of the organizations that have been essential parts of Cambridge Retrofit. Now, as Cambridge retrofit as an organization begins to wind down, um, uh, these organizations are the ones that step forward and, and carry on the activity. So the, the real purpose of Cambridge Retrofit is simply to get these groups talking to each other, get them to begin their activities, and then Cambridge Retrofit as an activity can step, or as an organization, can step aside and these groups carry out the work. The ones with red dots beside them own significant estates in in Cambridge and therefore they represent demand which you'll see on the next slide and again they are therefore essential in driving forward the the um, uh, activities so now we're into the difficult part creating demand there's a good business case for for retrofits um, uh, we need it in order to hit our climate targets, but the demand for retrofits has been surprisingly difficult to achieve all over the world. So how are we going to create demand? In Cambridge Retrofit, this was done by uh, dividing the website, the Cambridge Retrofit website, up into two parts. The black and purple one, which you saw earlier, it really contains all the material up to the point of this discussion. Now there is the Making It Happen website that you see here, which is where the people are brought together, the organizations are brought together to carry out the project. So we clearly separate out understanding in the purple and black part and doing here in what we call the blue and gold part. And you can see some of the retrofit pilot projects at the bottom left hand side of this, uh, of this slide. There is a nine step process that all properties that are going to go into the retrofit program must pass through that they are particularly important for a stakeholder. So number one, get the internal commitment. So here we have the, uh, the, 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 the former uh, head of Royal Bank of Scotland, deputy head of, of Royal Bank of Scotland, um, giving his approval for carrying this out, carrying out the retrofit program in uh, RBS and NatWest buildings. So that box is ticked. An estate assessment means looking at all the properties in an estate and getting a sense of which properties are high in emissions, which ones are low. This then leads to a priority properties being identified. Identify those properties that are, are of highest priority because they're easy to retrofit and they have uh, very high emissions. That's actually since been accomplished by RBS, so there could be a tick on this slide. Have you secured the finance? Well, that's easy for an organization like RBS. It's more difficult for uh, a homeowner, for example. Have you done a pre-retrofit assessment for some of the buildings? In other words, have you looked at some specific buildings that you've set as priorities and looked at the reasons for carbon emissions and therefore, next step, selected the retrofit options that you're going to put on? Will it be insulation? Will it be windows? Will it be LEDs for lighting and so forth? Select the options and then procure them so then deliver 
And then finally, there is a requirement of a post-retrofit assessment. A couple of years after the retrofit has been done, continuing to follow the energy consumption and CO2 emissions to see whether, in fact, they have gone down. This is all supplemented by a series of meet the buyer events. In meet the buyer events, the people who are demanding retrofits on the demand side, the uh, stakeholders, meet with the people who are supplying or delivering or financing in a big community event. You can see the, some of the companies that um, uh, attended one of the events, one of the meet the buyer events in the city of Cambridge. They were organized by Cambridge Clean Tech. You see. Uh, Martin Garrett from Cambridge Clean Tech in the picture here. And so the idea of the Meet the Buyers event is to get together the people who want the retrofits, the people who can provide the retrofits, the people who can facilitate the retrofits through government and so forth, get them working as a team and then send them out of the meeting so that they can then carry on their business activity around the retrofits. This is an example of the kind of assessment that I spoke about earlier. It's from Cambridge City Council. I'm not going to tell you which particular building this is um, in the right-hand side because that, that is confidential information for the City of Cambridge. The City of Cambridge stepped forward as one of the strongest partners in their estate for Cambridge Retrofit, so we'd like to congratulate them for that, or thank them for it, I should say. And the, the material on the right-hand side shows the kind of information that is assessed for any given retrofit. It shows you what the retrofit measure is going to be or what the uh, an instrument or technology is going to be. And then it shows you a series of carbon um, and financial uh, indicators of the performance if you do the retrofit. So this is done for any building that one wants to move forward on in retrofitting. And the attempt, therefore, is to find the most cost-effective means of getting at carbon reduction. This kind of assessment has to be done separately for different classes of buildings. So we've assembled a lot of information on what a retrofit would do in a building if you put in insulation, new windows, etc. But that answer depends critically on which category of building your building falls into. So here you see eight categories on the next slide, which I'll go to now. You'll see four more categories. So you're, you're looking at roughly 12 categories of buildings in the city of Cambridge, each with unique activities going on inside them in unique building characteristics, and therefore there need to be bespoke assessments of the carbon reduction potential in each of these building types. And this simply shows you the, the kind of reduction that one gets under a particular category of buildings. Here the category is semi-detached, small detached residents. So this is the kind of calculation that goes into the building assessment that would be carried out before a retrofit is done on a building. And it ends with the, the total, it's called cost benefit or savings to investment ratio. As we get towards the end, I, I want to point out that when a, uh, a delivery agent in particular is trying to identify where they want to go to uh, stimulate business in retrofits, they're looking for parts of the city that have uh, particular characteristics. Ideally, these would be properties that are in need of retrofit, where there is a single owner of many different properties, so they don't have to go knocking on doors to be able to get each property in, uh, where that organization that owns the properties might be required to do the retrofit. For example, city council is required to do some retrofits. University of Cambridge and its colleges are required and so forth. So we divided the city up into tiles that you see here. And the students who were participating in the project over the last decade um, uh, created the database and created a Google Map version of these tiles. You'll see the Google Map vision in, in just a moment. Overlaying the map are things such as this, I'm just giving this as an example, which is conservation area. 
it's conservation areas or areas that have historical buildings in them, they are more difficult to uh, obtain permission to retrofit, and the cost of the retrofit uh, is often significantly higher. So we've overlaid various sorts of areas onto the, onto the tiles that you saw a moment ago. And as I said, this is all put into a Google map, so you can go to the Google map that you'd find on the website that you'll see at the very end of this presentation. And if you click on a tile, you get information about what kinds of buildings are there, what their ages are, um, information about the uh, energy consumption in those buildings on average, and so forth. And again, the idea is that a delivery agent is going to use this information or uses this information to identify where they might start knocking on doors in a city. Ideally, you would tie retrofits into the schedule of repair, replacement, and new capital investment for a building. And the reason is that many of the retrofits that will be carried out in buildings will never pay back the initial capital investment on the basis of the savings in energy. It costs more than you're going to save in energy. And as a result, you get a good business case if what you can do is enhance the asset value of the property. Is the property a greater sale value? If it's a rental property, can you rent it more frequently and at higher price and so forth? So we encourage all property owners, all the demand side, to consider their repair, repair replacement, and new capital investment cycle. And when they get ready for one of these parts of their cycle, it's at that time that the retrofit might be done. So we're right at the very uh, we're right at the very end of the presentation. This probably is an odd slide you would think to to end with with Saint Bernard of Clairvaux. Um, uh, Saint Bernard said more than a thousand years ago that hell is filled with good intentions and desires. Um, and what that means is um, it's not enough to simply desire to do something or to say you'll do something. What matters is whether you actually carry it out. We've adopted a, a, a paraphrased version of that at Cambridge Retrofit, which is we're not here to save your souls. And what we mean by that is if you're interested in reducing the risk of climate change and therefore you're participating in Cambridge Retrofit, welcome to the table. If you simply want to reduce your energy bills, welcome to the table. If you You've got something to sell in Cambridge retrofit then welcome to the table and so on and so on we don't care why you are at the table we realize that people come to the retrofit process for a variety of reasons we don't judge why it is that you're at the at the table what matters is that you are contributing to the process of retrofit so you cannot make a retrofit effort at community scale work if there's a requirement that everybody be there for the same single reason of reducing uh, the risk of climate change. That, therefore, is the, the end of the presentation. Again, this has been Doug Crawford Brown. I was at the University of Cambridge for a long, long time, uh, directing the Cambridge Center for Climate Change Mitigation Research. I retired in 2016 and moved to Santa Barbara, California. You can see the uh, email addresses that you can contact me through. You can see my phone number here. And the Cambridge Retrofit websites, which I showed you earlier, are being migrated to the uh, Google site here. Year. If you are in a community other than Cambridge and you want to create a Cambridge retrofit kind of activity, I can therefore, we can therefore uh, provide a white brand version of the website and the process uh, so that you can carry out these kinds of activities in your community. Thank you very much for listening.